Hi, I'm Connor Quimby, and this is How to Make an Awful Conling, Episode 6, Creating New Types of Writing Systems. In the previous How to Make an Awful Conling episode, The Writing Script, I mentioned that you, when designing the writing script for your awful conling, could create an entirely new type of writing system. However, I went no further than that because at the time, I was unable to think of any examples. Well, I've spent the past year and a half devoting a significant 35% of my brain power to coming up with new types of writing systems. But before we go any further in this video, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters, with special thanks to Kiernick, Agmashwa, Pirate, Eden, and Office Couple, who also helped me out on this video. If you enjoy my videos, please consider subscribing and or supporting me on Patreon. Your support is a large reason I'm able to make my videos, so thank you. The best way to think about writing systems, in my opinion, is glyph per unit. So, an alphabet is theoretically a glyph per phoneme. Objads are a glyph per consonant, avogitas are a glyph per consonant with customizable skins, syllabries are a glyph per syllable, and logography is generally a glyph per morpheme. Now, some of you may be thinking, what about featural systems like Hangul? Well, after the last video on this topic, I realized that featural systems aren't really systems by themselves. They normally take the form as alphabets, so that's my mistake. Hangul is essentially just a featural alphabet. Each glyph represents a phoneme, and those glyphs are smushed into groups of up to three for organization. Now, let's create some units to organize our types of writing systems in a visual display. If we use the phoneme as the fundamental building block and base our scale off of it, then our units would be glyphs per phoneme. So, a true alphabet like the International Phonetic Alphabet would have a value of 1 glyph per phoneme. Objads would have a value somewhere less than 1, and syllabries, abugidos, and logographies greater than 1. Oh yeah, and ideographies are a thing. I guess they could fit anywhere on the scale depending on how advanced the writing is, from pictographs to proto-logographies. We can make this scale a bit more in-depth by adding units greater than the phonemes such as the mora, syllable, morpheme, and word. You'll note that there is some uncharted territory on this scale. Our new types of writing systems will be first created by moving our glyph per units value to these open spaces, and then I guess because I want more watch hours, or no, because this is supposed to be an awful conling, we'll jump completely off of the glyph per unit scale and just break the idea of writing systems. It's finally sample time! Here are four new types of writing systems. The Alphabet most alphabets in the world are flawed, as pronunciation involves faster than orthography, or the fundamental alphabet structure of one phoneme per glyph, one glyph per phoneme is forsaken. The alphabet is a type of writing system with the basis of two glyphs per phoneme. In other words, everything is a digraph. Scores of languages that use the Latin alphabet use digraphs for certain phonemes. Therefore, the alphabet is already a system partially in use today. One could also interpret two glyphs per phoneme as such. There are two possible glyphs, either of which can be used to write a phoneme. The usage of one glyph over the other could have grammatical, etymological, or just organizational significance, which is strikingly similar to the usage of hiragana and katakana in Japanese, or kind of like how kamai and tai often have two or more glyphs per consonant. Both interpretations of the alphabet would have a glyph per phoneme value of two and go here in our graph. You know what? I think it's time for a sample time. Let's take the English word based and transliterate it to the International Phonetic Alphabet. Using the first interpretation of the alphabet and creating a digraph for each phoneme, we can spell based as such. Alternatively, using the second interpretation, we could create two different glyphs for each phoneme, and as shown on screen, we could spell based like this or like this. Since the alphabet is a relatively tame new type of writing system, if you choose to use it in your awful conling, make sure to follow the tips I laid out in How to Make an Awful Conling, Episode 5. Make bad glyphs or choose poorly. Make any potential reader suffer. The anti abugida In an anti abugida vowels form the base glyph with consonants marked as add-ons. This isn't all that awful, but I'm sure you can make orthography a mess, and also there's the potential usage of an anti abugida with phonologically incompatible language. If your conling is consonant heavy or vowels are lacking, then we find ourselves in a very similar situation to the previous video, with just the roles of vowels and consonants reversed. By the way, if your conling has any semi-vowels, this would be a very good time to be inconsistent with both glyphs and placement in the anti abugida or standard abugida structure. The anti abugida would fall somewhere here on our glyph per phoneme graph, of course dependent on how incompatible a language's phonology is with the system. The Morabri Technically, this already exists. 
Hiragana and Katakana are already more abric syllabaries, not called Mora briefs because as far as I know I'm the first to call it that. The Mora is a forgotten unit that has significance in only a few languages, notably Japanese, Sanskrit, and a few others. The Mora is essentially a way to break up a syllable with regards to syllable weight. A short vowel in the nucleus of the syllable is one Mora, a long vowel or diphthong would be two, the same goes for syllabic consonants, and the coda can also be a Mora. Thus, we can see that any language that has syllables also has more, regardless if they have any significance at all. Japanese uses them the most of any language that I know about. Take the common Japanese word onichan. There are three syllables, o, ni, and chan, but there are five more, o, ni, i, cha, and n. Writing this in hiragana or katakana shows the mora in use. If you want to make a mora brief for your conling, do not give the mora any significance. As well, I would recommend having poorly defined phonotactics and, of course, to follow all the tips given in the episode on creating your glyphs. The mora brief goes here on our glyph prophoneme graph. The Locography I've discussed many different ways to make a bad writing system for your awful conling, but I've never really expressed my full dislike of logographies, as although they have cultural and historical value and they can be pretty darn cool, they are also objectively not a good way to do writing systems. Don't like that? You know what to do. Send me your complaints on a Sumerian clay tablet. Now, I've accidentally sort of turned this video into pushing the concept of writing systems to its limit, instead of making an awful conling. But fear not. Logographies are the best existing system to make an awful conling, and we can increase the value stored in each character for even more insanity. With a locography, instead of having a glyph or character per morpheme, you have a glyph for a full word with all the fancy grammar you could want. No longer are logographies restricted to working well with only analytic languages. I figured since we're making an awful conling and logographies are bad, it would make sense to invent a way to bring that awfulness to a wider array of conlangs. The idea is to take the base morpheme character and any inflections for any grammatical purpose are added as an add-on to the original character. So, if the character for the verb to jump is this, a locography could denote verb conjugation with perhaps a person marker, mood, tense, etc. Honestly, this has made me appreciate logographies much more, and I didn't even need to have a traumatic brain injury to do such. The logography would have a glyph for word value of 1, which could denote a glyph for phoneme value of 1, or a glyph for phoneme value of 167. Let's do a quick sample time. Let there be a conlang with the morpheme pronounced, oh, I don't know, kananugeti, written with this glyph. Now, this would be the basic state. For simplicity's sake, we'll say it's nominative and singular, and maybe to show plurality, the character would be modified to this. This conlang would naturally have more cases than nominative, such as the accusative, genitive, partitive, inessive, illative, adessive, ablative, allative, essive, translative, instructive, abessive, and commutative cases, which would all have their own modifications of the original morpheme, perhaps like this. Come to think of it, this isn't the worst way you could do a logography with an agglutinative language. All right. That's enough with working within the scaling graph. Time to break it. We should consider the following. Perhaps we are limiting ourselves by using the glyph per unit system. Can we create new types of writing systems that actually fit the moniker of awful by removing ourselves from the scale? Yes. Yes, we can. In order to break linguistics, we must do what physicists did to enter the realm of quantum. Ask the most fundamental questions. We are going to enter what I call quantum linguistics. Quantum linguistics is a dark realm filled with assumptions and guesses, for it is all seemingly basic content. Take the atom, the fundamental building block of the world. Everybody knows what it is, and yet quantum physics and quantum chemistry still asks, what is an atom? We take the most basic topics and push them to their extremes, into the theoretical. For instance, what is a phoneme? Of course, it's a sound that can be combined with other phonemes or perhaps be left alone, and is associated with a linguistic meaning. And here, I hope you can see what I mean by pushing these questions to the fundamental limit. There is so much dark, unexplored space in our definition of phoneme if we prod hard enough. Are the grunts of early hominids phonemes? Are the hatonyms of the conling k-bop phonemes? Can snapping or clapping be phonemic? What even gives the sound linguistic meaning? What is linguistic meaning? With quantum linguistics, each attempt to answer or explore a question should result in even more questions and unknowns. Now that you understand how I'm trying to break linguistics, back to types of writing systems. Let us think about the following questions. 
What is a writing system? What distinguishes visual communication from writing? If you write with your inner monologue reading imaginary glyphs to yourself, have you actually written and spoken? What is a glyph? Is proto-writing writing? What is writing? If we just attempt to answer that final question, we'll have the most fundamental basis on which to build the others. The essence of writing in any form is to encode information through markings, and thus the pieces come together. Proto-writing can be considered writing because information is encoded, and a glyph is thus a semi-permanent mark on a medium in which units of information, traditionally phonemes, can be encoded. Writing and reading imaginary glyphs is not actually writing and reading, since no medium for semi-permanent glyphs has been marked upon. Writing can be distinguished from visual communication by the presence of both the glyphs and the medium. And lastly, a writing system is a set of glyphs that together are used to write a language. Okay, my brain is fried from trying to think of how to do this, but I think I've got two semi-decent ideas of how to write beyond the glyph per unit scale. Writing sign language and writing with numerals. Signing can encode anything from a letter, phoneme, to a whole sentence fragment, while skipping over the verbal connotations. So sign language glyphs are essentially a different way to the information encoded within, instead of going the traditional glyph per unit route. And then there's writing with numerals. Counting and core arithmetics tie beautifully in with language, because they are information encoded by writing outside of traditional linguistic meaning. You know what? If I ever make a How to Make an Awful Conling episode 7, it's going to be on numerals. They deserve their own video. But my overall point is this. If you can think of a way to encode information outside of the glyph per unit system, or even traditional linguistic meaning, please go for it. Will it necessarily earn the title of awful? Probably not. My guess is it will be pretty cool, actually. Except for learning. For the user will have to reprogram how they read and write, which is a pretty good way to add icing on the cake for an already awful conling. Some of you may be thinking, well, that was needlessly long. Hey, watch hours are watch hours, so thank you for watching, and massive thanks to Office Gobble for proofreading and helping me out with the script at parts. Until next time, I'm Connor Quimby, and this has been How to Make an Awful Conning, Episode 6, Creating New Types of Writing Systems.